Sup everybody, this is Carrick with ACG and welcome to part two of my walking the walk for, of course, Homefront Revolution. Now, I promised you guys we would not have another Mass Effect situation where if there was issues, I wouldn't do the second part. And of course that was save game corruption. This one was the plain and simple fact that both the Xbox One and the PS4's frame rate mixed with tight FOVs was absolutely terrible. I'm telling you, the moment I got outside and I was getting ready to film part two, it ended up becoming a slideshow. And that was not only physically debilitating for me to play and actually made me quite ill, but I knew that people trying to watch this would probably feel the same way. So what did I do? Went out and got the PC version because I promised you guys that I would do it. And of course, this is part two. So some of the things that I noticed when I was playing this, basically I had to clear out a small section so that I could walk through the locations you know, I talk about how the reflection of life comes up, how characters and the job systems and everything sort of mends together to create that feeling of reality. I have to say that currently, I'm actually highly impressed with the AI. Now, that doesn't mean that there are mistakes of any kind or it doesn't mean that it's perfect. That's not even what this is about. What I am talking about is the fact that it does flank and pincer and it performs all of the things that you would want from good AI in any particular locations. Now, you can also end up getting people to help you on the resistance and recruiting them. And I found that they were, I would say, mediocre. They're actually, they're a little bit better than that. It just sort of depends on what you're engaged in. But I'm really, I, I just like the overall texture work here. You know, few games, I think, can really solidify that feeling of an apocalypse or World War Three or what have you and do it really well and keep that variation going. Variation is just so important. And not only do we have that kind of situation here with a good amount of variability, but you have that past future, future past that I talk about where you have like the things built up here, all of these extra secondary reinforcement locations. Well, you can actually watch certain characters building those at night or at least pretending to build them at night, which does a good job sort of solidifying that fiction that this is a real place. It's vital for characters to sort of engage within the game world itself for you to feel like it's real. I mean, there's that line of fiction that you sort of need to cross to really get into a title. Okay, so there's a bad guy they're talking about up here. Let me take him out. I'm really impressed. You can own an area and be in control of it, and the bad guys will still sneak snipers in. Very cool. Sucker! Probably shouldn't be trying to use the SMG from this far away, but the bad guys will sort of sneak in, and they will... Oh, headshot. Dead. And they will try to take you out regardless it sort of reminds me of you know behind enemy lines or at enemy at the gates that kind of thing where people still come in of course unfortunately there's the desiccated and destroyed body of my well i was going to call her teammate but i'm not quite sure and right now above us you can hear one of those hindenburg like i guess you'd call them steel balloon submersibles that float in the air <laughs> that the enemies have and i love the fact that i control the area and they still send to these guys and if they catch you they'll still drop enemies down so the debris system here looks really good. A, a lot of games won't have the same debris from the building next to them, even though the building's destroyed, which always surprises me. I think there's somebody over there. Nope. And here, oh, yeah, okay, there we go. I really like that overall look. You know, it reminds me in some ways of the lines of the Normandy in Mass Effect, but not quite sure how they handle propulsion in a big metal sphere like that. It, it, it's like an air submersible, but it still looks really cool, and basically they troll the area. Of course, it has the sound of the Mass Effect horn of destruction from the Reapers, but and there you get a little bit of a frame rate hit. Unfortunately, on the PC, there is definitely a memory leak of some kind, and it does crop up, so... I will keep an eye on it. One of the things I want to talk about is map mess. Now, map mess is basically you open up that map and you just see icons everywhere. It's something that we've discussed or I've discussed multiple times in the Walking the Walk and discussed different games that I felt did a, a worse or better job at sort of alleviating that. Let's uh, take these. Haha, -ha, I love this gun. So the reason why I feel that this game does a very good job in that and the reason why I think a cu couple reviewers actually mentioned that they felt in many ways it sort of out Ubisoft Ubisoft when it came to the handling of its side missions. I feel that that sense of accomplishment is here, that sense of each place being slightly unique. Even, you know, you got to realize I played the Xbox One version, PS4 version, and now the PC version. And not getting bored with some of these locations is very interesting and surprising to me. And I think that that's one of the reasons why I feel that each place is sort of unique. Now, about the 50th time you hear that there's, you know, some kind of person trying to take over one of your areas, that can get a little bit annoying. You will definitely feel a little bit of that repetitiveness. But it's not in the same way as an Ubisoft 
Ubisoft game. It's not in the same way as I think some people have complaints towards them. Boy, that frame rate is atrocious, and I apologize, guys. That is just whenever you spawn in a bunch of guys, that AI, that's not the memory leak. That's when AI sort of flood an area and you get that issue there. But anyway, so when it comes down to map mess, map mess is really important to me that games sort of find out a way. If you want to have towers, you need to make those towers. You need to make something poignant occur at each one or make the location very, very unique. And that's very difficult, I think, in an Assassin's Creed game or something like that. And it's one of the reasons why I think that's forefront in many gamers' original complaints towards those titles. It's probably one of the reasons why I liked Mad Max, because though some of the areas look the same, they did a good job with variations on enemies in locations and making you feel like you had to do particular things to get into them, even if it was something as small as trying to figure your way through a little, not mini puzzle, but getting a door unlocked or open. And, uh, hang on one second. I'm telling you, this is just the absolute most difficult walk in the walk I've ever done. There's bad guys here again. There, it's just there is no place that's safe. And uh, like I said, you know, it does feel a little bit like Enemy at the Gates, where you're you're putting snipers behind enemy lines and stuff. But at the same time, you you just can't rest. You know, there's almost no place that's perfectly safe. You sucker. Why did I? Oh, okay. Well, that worked. Uh, actually, it didn't work. I ended up dying one second later. So, anyway, map mess. When it comes down to it, just one of those situations where I feel that this game has actually done a fairly good job in alleviating that. And as I move forward, you know, I'm not going to give a rating on the title right now. As I move forward, that repetitiveness may build up. And I think that that's normal for a gamer. Most people who play these kind of games probably don't feel that repetitive right, uh, repetitiveness right away. But as it builds up, we'll go ahead and see sort of how it's handled and how I feel later on. But right now, I really do like uh, even this place here, the sense of accomplishment of taking this place over. There were enemies. I mean, they were spilling out of this place. It was like a damn spider nest. And oh, sweet. Jesus. Hang on. Also, to make this easier, I've switched to the gamepad so that it's a little bit smoother in transitions and movement, but it's a little bit harder to aim. Um, fuck one. <laughs> All right, let's take this guy out. Stop, drop, and roll. Of course, trying to aim with the damn gamepad versus the keyboard and mouse isn't the funnest at all, but okay, he's dead. Come on, guys. Take out that other dude. Take him out. Take him out. Probably not the best weapon for this, but let's uh, reach out and touch somebody. Or not. How about that? Tag. Dang it, man, just dug in like ticks. I do have to say, at least the AI's good. Really, I, I would say when it comes to the AI, it's really sort of cool because of so many different things going on. In fact, the AI mixed with the way the game continually doles them out really does keep the feeling of a war-torn area alive and that feeling that you never really control an area completely Though, I will say it is quite lenient with that. So a lot of people might be looking at it and going like, oh, dude, I don't want to continually have to fight people off of areas that I've taken over. That does occasionally happen, but I still feel that it's actually quite fair. Let me uh, let me just undig. Oh, somebody else had the same idea I did. Okay, maybe. And goodbye. So anyway, of things that I like, I certainly like that, you know. And I like that feeling that the game has of the, that living breathing world. You know, it's one of those things that we see missing in a lot of first-person shooters where whether this is a good game or a mediocre game or a terrible game, it still does it better than many others. In some ways, it feels like Precursors, which is, if you guys get a chance, go check that out. I, I've talked about it in the past. Precursors is a very enjoyable title that is space game, where you're basically, you can fly ships, you can drive on the ground, you can go explore planets, you can have a first-person shooter. It pretty much does everything, but it does everything in sort of a mediocre way, if that makes sense. And sometimes those games can be really fun sandboxes, uh, even though they're not perfect. So the Flashpoint is pretty much one of those situations where they you have an area and the enemy is trying to not necessarily take it back over, but they're attacking it and you can go back and save them. But I just wanted to show you guys some of this with the rebar. Oh, man. See, this kind of stuff. Oh, Lord. So basically those Hindenburg things, man, once they shine their light on you, they basically end up dropping enemies down and it can be just such a disaster if you don't really try to... Oh, Lord. Try to escape. Now, I may sound like I'm frustrated. At, you know, trying to do a walk in the walk, certainly it's difficult. But it, when it comes to the game, I'm just going to be brutally honest. You know, this is that's what the channel's about. Whether you agree with me or not, I'm just going to give you my honest assessment of the title. And that is that it's got an incredible amount that I like. It has a... Oh, man. Jesus. 
you know what? I'll just leave this up. Forget it. it it's got an incredible amount that I really like. It's got a, a, a lot of enjoyment in the way it sort of doesn't segregate your battle and your exploration and your exploration and your sort of interest within the game world and exploring. It can all be done at the same time, and I really like that. There isn't that separation of church and state that you have in a lot of games where it's like, I've taken this place over, no one can ever go there. That's not what goes on here. Now, it makes them safer, but it doesn't make them totally impervious. I love this right here. You know, a lot of games will have a character gesticulating for no reason. That does happen here, but what I like is a lot of times they're like crying or they're having P PTSD kind of situations, and that's sort of cool. And it, it, it's not perfect. It doesn't really line up exactly with what's going on sometimes in the character models or animations, but still, it's just that little extra step. You know, we know that this game was basically done and redone at least twice, and I think that sort of like an editor looks over a book and changes it and sort of improves some aspects. We do see some aspects of this game that show a little bit of polish underneath all of these problems. And some of that polish exists in the world state and how much you can do. And when we go to the city, I'll be able to show you that, you know, this is the destroyed area. But you know what, let's just, actually what I'm gonna do, yeah, let's just go to the city so you guys can see that and see sort of the change up in the overall graphic presentation as well as the gameplay. Okay, looks like we jumped in at, at nighttime, but I'll show you some of this town, and hopefully we'll get to some of the daytime before we end this. This, when you first start in this location, is basically completely patrolled by the enemy. And what you do is, by turning on the radios and stuff like that, you slowly end up subverting it towards yourself. I love this. It's like one of those homeless camps here on the left. So well done. Just everything about it. And there are some really cool touches, like they, they put uh, tires around candles, because a tire is a very good break for wind around candles. You'll see that in some of these places. You also see candles, of course, sitting out. But there's a lot of just really cool extra side effects sitting on a tire rim like that, even though, let's be honest, you'd probably want to just try to sell that. But this area looks really cool. I love the overall feel. And it is populated differently depending on night and day and depending on how much you unlock uh, this Hearts and Minds, how much, how many missions you do. And the world changes around you. You know, it starts out with people on pallets sort of screaming at the enemy. And then over time, suddenly you have people just running around, beating on cars with bats and sort of dissension in the works kind of situation. And it just gets progressively worse and worse as you do more to sort of get behind, as you can see, the Hearts and Minds that's up on the left and I love it. it it was really cool to experience that because I was not expecting that kind of changeover and once again I want to remind people that just because I like stuff about this doesn't mean I absolutely love the game or think it's without problems that's not what these videos are about actually let me see if something happens here I want to show you guys some of the live events if it occurs Oh, it doesn't. Okay. Sometimes you can really trigger off some major situations by, let's say, cutting open a door. Oh, here we go. So this pallet here, you have this guy speaking to people. That guy is not there when you're starting and playing and stuff like that. Some, some of these guys are sort of introduced as more and more things happen around the city. And you get the hearts and minds and you sort of get people on your side. It's very well done. You might see a little bit of a V-Sync issue, sorry about that, but occasionally, especially with this game, trying to get it to run, trying to get it to record and do, and do well is unfortunately not perfect. You love this colored lighting right here. So cool. And of course, Willows, the, the fake Windies, love that. Really, really well done fakery there. They've even got a mimicry of that font. Very, very close. And even of Windy herself. It's just really well done. Now, here as we're... Oh, there we go. And you start seeing this. You start seeing signs of dissent more and more as it, you basically continue to unleash those hearts and minds until basically you take over the entire town and make the town pretty much yours, even though they do have some uh, en enemy strongholds in the locations. It's very cool. Just go around here. Also, I was really surprised, though there is loading between these major zones, the major zones are massive, by the way, but then you basically go in and it tells a story or it gives you a cutscene and you move forward. I was really surprised by how large they were and all of the things you could do. In town here, for example, the roofs. Uh, you can go on all of them. You can do all kinds of things, like take over areas and make them bases. You know, when you look at Ubisoft games, a lot of times people complain because they feel like, oh, I just, you know, sort of took, got up to the top of the tower and I synchronized. I, I got up to the top of the tower and I heard an eagle cry and that was it. In this game, 
one thing that really impressed me is that that's not at all what happens. You end up going into the into the area, you end up taking it over, and you end up making a base out of it. And there's like people in it walking around. We saw that a little bit with Assassin's Creed, actually. But it, it really seems to be brought to the next level here. I'm gonna take this. Now I'll probably get I'll probably get congratulated for murder here. It's like yes, good. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> He's like, get people on our side by murdering others, but. That is sort of what the game is about in, in this area. You don't get hearts and minds for those murders. I love this. And if you go up and look at those, right up there, those solar panels, you actually see that they're correctly wired into the walls. I just thought that that was sort of cool. Or at least wired into the walls, sorry. It, it's funny because when you compare this game, the only one recently to come out would be like, let's say, Division. And I have to say, when it comes to a debris, particle, just overall believability system, this one is actually better than Division. And, uh, you know, it's unfortunate that it's got these technical issues. And it's unfortunate that, you know, a lot of people didn't like it because there's a lot going on here. This is so impressive. Coming through here and seeing all these brownstones that you can interact with and, and you can do battle with. And the different color schemes. You know, color schemes are so important to sort of separate the different areas of the town. And you have the neon areas that we were just at with, you know, some darker areas. You have this rustic looking area here, and then you have the transition to where we are now, which is the old part of town. And of course the Left 4 Dead RV. That RV always cracks me up when I see it here. That's just what it looks like, but really cool overall area. Here to the left, you know, you see the graffiti up there to tell you that there's something within this house. And the multi-layered homes, you know, they didn't really spare any expense when it came to the geometry. They actually sort of nailed the look. And I have to say, some of these little tiny extras and add-ons that they did are surprising. But like I said, you know, this is a game we know was made and remade a couple times. And I have a feeling what really happened is maybe the locations themselves were sort of created and then bettered each time while maybe the gameplay changed and we do know that the gameplay did change and i think what you've got is this really cool location with maybe some problems in the gameplay department that'll crop up later on like repetitiveness dead <laughs> sorry repetitiveness or something like that but once again you have this completely different area here it and it sort of on the right you have i don't know if some kind of church but on the left here you have like Oh, hey, there's a, so there's an error in the reflection. It's reflecting trees, apparently, unless I'm going crazy. Looks like it's it's uh, a fake reflection that's reflecting trees incorrectly. <laughs> but see, oh yeah, that's the thing. And their responses get worse and worse as you sort of free more hearts and minds, which is awesome. There's this push-pull you can see of their aggressiveness, the more freedom you guys sort of try to take. And here you see the graffiti, the American flag. Really a lot of detail, I think, with this location and making it feel like these are actual houses and buildings. All of this blue you see, that's actually because freedom fighters have started to take over some of these areas, and they, that's not present when you start. Let's go inside. Always got to click the light on. There's always some, you know, occasional things in here that you can grab, but... And sound-wise, you know, sound, everybody asks me about sound, like, what do I like about something? What what sort of makes me feel like sound is good? Well, I, I hate when, every, when anything's muddy or there's no variation. No variation is probably the worst. But in a game where there is, let's say, gun battles like this in enclosed city streets, I both like and hate this game. <laughs> I like it because I think that at times it actually has some excellent sound effects. Oh, I like that picture. Yeah, that's cool. That reminds me of the old revolution paintings that they used to do. That actually might be one. It might be a mimicry of one. Somebody can uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But when it comes to the sound effects, I really there's a lot of parts I really like, especially voices here. You can see, hear that guy sort of resonate across the pavement. But then sometimes you'll be firing a weapon and you'll be like, this doesn't really impact. It's got a low end, but it doesn't really impact with the, the, the special effects that sort of make you feel like it's alive in the moment. Now, see, sorry about that frame rate. We're, we're starting to get hit a little bit. Oh, Christ. Beirut. <laughs> yeah, I, I, let, me, uh, let me see. Die. Okay, there we go. All right, so what's happened is we got spawns coming in, and so your frame rate dies. This is pretty much what anybody who's ever played an Arma game or something like that has seen, where you're playing a single-player level, boom, and I'm just going to try to get up here. You see a single-player, and you play the game, and suddenly it's Beirut, a bunch of bad guys are there, and you cannot end up moving because your frame rate's so low when those AI spawn in, and they're all running computationally heavy search patterns. That's what you get here. So I think I got far enough away for right now. 
Yeah, and this is a small part of the world. Now, one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to try to get you to the other side as well. It may be a little difficult, but we'll try to get there, especially when I'm talking because I'm not paying exact attention here. But I just love this look of where everything is just sort of falling apart. And you can see over time, it's like the military came in, the military sort of conquered the civilian populace, and then you can't kill them all, right? You can't because you don't have enough people to even run the place. So what you do is you let some of them live and you can sort of see that secondary civilization being built up. I love that. That's probably the best graffiti artist ever, standing like six feet away. <laughs> so we'll go here and we'll take a quick gander. People walk in the streets, they do different things, they sort of engage in different activities. There's nothing super detailed, and I'm trying to think of a game that's really hyper detailed. Maybe like uh, uh, Elder Scrolls where they might have four or five actions they may take. These guys usually take two or three. Son of a bitch! Let's take this guy. Oh! So because this one's shorter, what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump forward, uh, take out some of these guys, and show you guys this transition from the wor one world state to the next, which I think is really pretty important to the story. So because I want this one to be shorter, you know, two parts, they shouldn't both be an hour long. One of the things I've done is basically taken out some guys and we're at around, looks like 96% in the hearts and minds. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a couple actions, get us to that 100% and you guys can see this worldview change. And we've, you know, already you guys can see just from the last time we played, you guys already saw that there was, uh, you know, people beating on cars and stuff like that. You saw that worldview. But what we're going to do now is we're going to turn it to 11. We're going to basically switch that over to 100%. You can sort of see the difference that occurs within the world state itself. You probably already see some differences between what was going on in the past, a uh, little bit of the recording, and now. And you can hear it, I'm certain. They've changed up a lot of the vocal cues and a lot of the sound cues to sound like people sort of in rebellion. But I'm just going to grab some stuff here because I want you guys to see all of this. So, let's see, there's something, I believe, let me cut this, what do we get for that? Okay, oh, okay, 100%. So that got me killed almost instantly. Uh, again, you know, you ha really have to be listening to this game when you're playing it, and it's difficult to do it like this, but what I'm doing is getting us outside. Now, you guys saw originally the state of the world and sort of the revolution it was in, in, the, in those two particular aspects. Now we see the third, this is really considerably open revolt, which I love because it, it adds that world state change that I think a lot of gamers like and a lot of gamers enjoy. And I was pretty impressed by it, to be brutally honest, because again, like I said, I think what we're seeing here is a game that's got a pretty interesting game world that maybe has some issues elsewhere. But when we come out here, what you'll see many times is the enemies in sort of a full retreat under the continued attack of these people who finally said, you know what, we're going to shirk off the yoke of these oppressors and we're going to take them down. And I think that that's so awesome. There's a really cool poignancy to the characterization of these people. And they become sort of less NPCs, I think, and more actual people doing things. Like you'll see them beating the bad guys. You'll see them, you know, taking them and destroying their vehicles. And occasionally you will see the enemy sort of try to stage little small comebacks, which I think is awesome as well. Again, it's one of those games that has a little bit more subtlety than I think a lot of games do. Oh, this is awesome right here. Yeah, so there. this is one of the enemy strongholds, and basically this would have never happened when you first start this area. They're, they're openly revolting right in front. Oh, shoot. And this occasionally happens too, where they just go absolutely batshit crazy, like they're just trying to kill everybody. And can't revolt if you're dead. So what we'll do is... Give him another shot, just in case. Always got to make sure. <laughs> so, anyway, when it comes down to it, you know, there's a lot of games where I think we all play and we feel like we don't make a change within the game world. And I think, to me at least, in many ways, that's part of the game strength itself. The strength of games as an interactive medium is the fact that you make change on them, whether it's making change in a game like Monopoly and gathering the most amount of money and winning or making a change in a role-playing game where you save the world or save the town or save the girl or save the guy. You know, there's, there's just always something about change. And I like that fact that you get it here, but in, in multiples. You don't just get that one world state change with a cutscene. You get the multiple prior, more subtle changes. So I think I'm going to cut this one short at about uh, 22, 23 minutes. 
I'm not going to say if this is a good game, and I'm not going to say if it's a bad game, because I'm not quite sure. You know, I've recently started talking about how I'm not a big fan of my own quick looks, even. Anything that's like an hour or two in a game, especially a game that's like eight or nine hours, because you never really understand at that seventh or eighth hour uh, how that sort of revolves back to your first hour, which is a tutorial. You might think the game's slow, and the game might not be slow at all. It might just be really preparing you for the complexity of later systems. And I think there's some unfairness there that even I myself, as a reviewer and a previewer and stuff like that, have to really make sure I understand so that I don't artificially color what my opinion of the game is. I'm going to take... and dead. When it down to it, I'll just say this. If I was to review this right now, it would most likely be a little bit higher than it probably will be when I'm done because you have repetition that sets in, you have different scales of systems that come in, you have to sort of go through those and find out where that sweet spot is of overlasting your time or overstaying your time in a title. But I will say this. I enjoy the game. There's a lot of technical issues, but it is actually quite fun. The open world aspect is very enjoyable. It is also highly, highly buggy, and I can see that impacting the... Oh, wait, that was... <laughs> Oh, that, well, that killed me. I could see that impacting a lot of reviewers' overall ideas of it. And I just don't feel like I am comfortable stating what this is until later when I sort of get an overall idea of it. I will play it. I will play it to completion. And uh, I don't know if I'll do a review. I may just end up doing a, a podcast or something like that and talking about it. Because it's an interesting title no matter what. You guys know me. I love the behind the scenes. I love the different feeling of, you know, I guess what you would say, the different feeling of creation that you get in these titles. And so I want to discuss it, and that'll probably come in a podcast. Anyway, hope you guys like this video. Sorry it was so disjointed. This is just one of those difficult games where because of the open world chaotic feeling and that anarchy, and this having some really cool anarchy chops when it comes down to it. I mean, things really are going crazy, but what's nice is not in that way that sometimes you're just looking at it and going like, why is that guy shooting that guy for no reason? I mean, things feel a little bit more organic, <laughs> but at the same time, it's inherently, it's just almost insanely difficult to walk somebody through this without crazy shit just happening 24 seven and sort of breaking your train of thought. So anyway, that's it for me. I hope you guys liked the video. Thumbs up if you did. Thumbs down if you didn't. Check out the Patreon. Check out the Reddit. Check out Twitter. All of that stuff really helps the channel. If you like these kind of videos, I can't stress enough just how much that kind of stuff really actually helps them continue coming. Peace out.